Is it possible to be happy at work? The answer is yes, and I'm going to show you how to do that. And then a tale of two cities. One is booming. The other is broken, and it has an impact on America. We'll talk about it. Helping you win at work so that you're winning in other areas of your life. This is the Ken Coleman Show. I'm Ken. Let's go. Let's answer the question. Can you be happy at work? Is it possible? Or is work just destined to be a place of drudgery? I got to get through it. I just got to make it through Monday. If I can make it to hump day on Wednesday, that means I've only got two days left until happy hour and whatever activities I have planned for the weekend to try to make the previous five days bearable and then somehow psych myself up on Sunday night to be able to drag myself out for another week and I rinse and I repeat. This is, as sad as that sounds, this is what a lot of people think work is. And they think, you know what? It is what it is. I've got to be a responsible human being I've got to take care of my family. I've got to provide. And so this is the way they look at work. And so they accept it. So is it possible to be happy at work? So I've had the privilege of interviewing what I believe and who I believe is maybe the foremost expert on happiness at work, Harvard-renowned researcher Sean Aker. I did an interview with Sean. We're going to be replaying that on the show soon. We want to recycle that for some of you uh, that have never heard it. And I've studied his work, I've studied his research, and the research bears out. It is, in fact, very, very possible to be so fulfilled in your work, even on the bad days, even on the intense days where you got a lot on you, your body of work, it's possible to actually make it through the work day, the work week, the work month, the work year, your entire career. You can do it and be truly happy. Now, how do you do it? I think there's five indicators that if you can meet all five of these criteria, you will be happy. Because this isn't, by the way, a bunch of mind over matter stuff and a bunch of kumbaya and sit around humming while you do yoga. This is actually, if I can put myself in these scenarios, I will be happy. The first is you got to be in the right seat. You got to be in the right seat of the bus. And, and so this is determined by I am in a position where I am good enough. I've got the talent to actually execute and pull it off. All right. And then we determine from there, is it in my sweet spot? Meaning that I love the work and I care deeply about the results. That's what I teach all the time when I'm using what I do best to do what I enjoy or love and I produce results that matter to me, I am in my sweet spot or I am certainly on the right seat of the bus. But let's go, let's just go one level down there. It is possible that you're in the right seat of the bus because you're in the stepping stone or you're on the stepping stone. So in other words, I can be happy at work if I'm in the right seat. The right seat being in my sweet spot where I am using what I do best to do what I love to produce results I care about, or I'm on a stepping stone, so it might just be something I'm good at. I may not love it. I might not be producing results that I care deeply about, but I'm on the stepping stone that leads me to that work. So that's what I mean by you are in the right seat. You're in the right seat. Let me tell you something. You can absolutely be happy at work. The second is you're healthy. You're healthy. What do I mean by that? You've got boundaries at work. In other words, you're at a place where you've got the maturity and you've got the relationship with your leader that you need to have where you can say, I can't take that on right now. See, if you're in a healthy environment, you will be healthy because you can say the things, raise the hands, ask for help, and a leader will understand, hey, you're swamped. I get it. I'm sorry. Let me figure it out. They give you real leeway to be able to say, 
I, I feel like I'm about to drown. Okay, we'll fix this or hang on two more days and then we fix it. They are engaged with you. So you have boundaries where you can actually say no. Now, for some of you, it starts with saying, I can't. No, I can't. You, my leader, tell me, if I take on something else, I have to drop something. Help me. Now, it starts with you raising your hand and seeing, am I in a healthy environment to where I can actually raise my hand? And I can say no. So being healthy means being happy. So the first part of that is I have some boundaries at work. The word no is not taboo. The second, I create boundaries at home. I'm not working at home very much. And my, my, my gauge would be little to none. And I mean little to none. That's my own personal rhythm. And I've made it work for me. You can make it work for you. So you're healthy because you have boundaries. Boundaries is the key. I'm able to say no. Next, you're valued. This is very simple. You're recognized and you are rewarded. You're recognized in meetings. You have a voice is the idea here. You're recognized and praised, if you will, by your leader. And as a result of being recognized, you are rewarded. The reward of being recognized in meetings and in projects, you get your ideas accepted. And they go, we're going to go with Ken's idea in this situation. You're also rewarded. The bonuses, uh, other other opportunities for, for not just your bonuses and commissions, but uh, special rewards and recognition. Fourth, you're on a good team. You're on a good team. It is, it is marked by collaboration and community. We work well together and we play well together. And otherwise, I, we're, we're eating together. Uh, maybe we do things out of the office every once in a while or when we're in the office, we have a good time. We collaborate. We, <coughs> excuse me, we work well together, but we also play well together. Collaboration and community here. These are the hallmarks of a good solid, healthy team. And then fifth, you have a ladder for growth opportunities. It has been made clear to you by your leader, leadership in the company, and you can see a path. You can see a path forward or you can see a ladder that you can climb. When we are in an environment where we realize if I come in and bust it and I do a good job here, I'm going to have an opportunity to get more responsibility, which means more money. Those are the five factors. You're in the right seat. You're healthy. You're valued. You're on a good team. And you have a ladder for growth. Those five factors are not myths. They aren't unicorns dancing out in the future and we can't ever seem to kind of lasso them in and, and get the opportunity. You have to look for this. You have to, in some ways, demand it by saying, this is the kind of environment I want to be in. And if I'm not going to be able to get this environment, I've got to move on. So you can be happy at work. And when you're happy at work, you're happy in the rest of your life. And that's good. Do you know what you were born to do? In order to get hired at a job you love, you need to get clear on your talent, passion, and mission. That's why our team created the Career Clarity Guide. In just a few minutes, this free tool will walk you through a process to discover what you do best, that's your talent, the work you love to do, that's your passion, and the results that matter to you, your mission. Then you'll feel more confident throughout the job search process. To get started, go to kencoleman.com slash clarity. Hey, if you are enjoying the show, if it's encouraging you, equipping you, would you help us by, if you're on YouTube, liking the videos that you're watching, subscribing to the channel, and sharing. Also, if you're listening via your favorite podcast app, give us a follow, a five-star review, and share as well. All right. A Tale of Two Cities 
fabulous uh, novel written by the legendary Charles Dickens. For those of you who are younger, if you've never read it, I think it is must-reading. It's really actually enjoyable, even though it's an old book. But I'm going to borrow that classic title to talk about economic development, the economy as a whole, and your financial future. How about that? How about that for wrapping it all in, all right? So this is straight out of the headlines, but this affects you and your future. You know the old phrase that Thomas Jefferson penned, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? This story, or these two cities, and the story I'm going to weave together absolutely matters to you. Here we go. We have two cities, and uh, we're going to break it down. First is, and we're going to call this one metropolitan area, Dallas-Fort Worth. For you Texans out there, I do know that Dallas is its own city and so is Fort Worth. But we're going to look at the metropolitan area of Dallas-Fort Worth, and then we're going to look at Los Angeles. All right? First, let's look at Dallas-Fort Worth. This is one of the country's fastest-growing metropolitan areas. The region added more people than any other U.S. metro between 2021 and 2022, with 170,000 plus new residents. Now, when that happens, business expansion and relocations become the major economic driver. They are now predicting that Dallas, economists are predicting that Dallas Fort Worth area will overtake the Chicago area and become the third most populous metro within the decade. Now, you're talking about Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, been the big three as long as I've been alive. But if you look at Chicago, what are you seeing when you see Chicago in the headlines? I'll tell you. A mediocre to crappy football team and a lawless city. That's what you see in the headlines. Nobody even talks about the Bulls anymore. The White Sox are they're 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 irrelevant. The Cubs are kind of like cool because of Fenway. I mean, excuse me, uh, Wrigley. Freudian slip there. All my Boston fans got all fired up for a second. All right, now, so that, that's what you think of when you think of Chicago: crime ridden, mob, riot, teens everywhere, new gunshot death every other minute. I mean, this is just the facts. That's what you think of. So Dallas Fort Worth, here it comes. Uh, 265 businesses have either relocated or expanded to Dallas-Fort Worth since 2020. That just gives you an idea. 265. Moving their entire operation and a lot of employees probably coming with it. Now, what does it have going for it? Well, here are a few things. Major airport, highway and rail access, very centrally located in the United States. Home to a number of major universities, which is meaning you're getting... A lot of new people coming in all the time. That's expanding the tax base. High skill, a lot of research, diversity, and a lot of room to expand because of the way it's situated in the topography. Now, here's what's interesting. Fort Worth has been a blue-collar city in its past versus Dallas, the more glitzy big city. And Fort Worth is known more for manufacturing and transportation businesses than finance and real estate, which you would see in Dallas. The city, though, is attracting new companies because of this identity. Robert Stearns, who's the director of economic development for the city of Fort Worth, is quoted in this article that I'm reading. We have a definable character. We're Cowtown, Stearns says. That's not something we shy away from. And uh, we we did it at Ramsey Solutions event in uh the Dallas Fort Worth area just about five months ago and we had a reception and we were meeting with a lot of people who are associated with Ramsey Solutions so our endorsed local providers in real estate and insurance and tax and, and, and on and on and on and on and on it goes and I picked that up at the reception I was meeting people where do you live where do you work and there absolutely is a political divide too so it's not just the economics of Fort Worth and how it's been in the type of businesses. It's been more blue-collar versus your white-collar in Dallas. Very interesting. Now, let's go on to our second city. 
And then I'm going to break this down. You're going to go, okay, how does this impact me? I'm going to tell you. Let's look at Los Angeles in the news. So while Dallas-Fort Worth is popping, all good stuff I just laid out, L.A.'s trying to nosedive the plane. The city of Los Angeles workers are now joining hotel employees, Hollywood actors, and TV and movie writers who have all walked into a strike this summer. So as I share this with you, tomorrow is the big day when thousands of city workers are going to strike. This includes sanitation workers, Los Angeles, International Airport, LAX employees, street services, all from Local 721, a union that represents more than 98,000 county and city workers across Southern California. This is from David Green, their executive director. We're going to shut down the city of Los Angeles. That's their goal. He says sanitation alone, sanitation workers, sanitation department of Los Angeles has over 900 vacancies. And we've been sounding the alarm for years. His beef, the city has sent people in to negotiate who do not have authority to make the changes that they're asking for. So, a tale of two cities. Dallas-Fort Worth is booming. Los Angeles is breaking. So let's look at why Los Angeles is breaking. Here's just a few reasons. Los Angeles is known for more government. Back-breaking regulations on the city level and the state level. More government. More government always means, you ready, high taxes. Interestingly enough, for all those high taxes, Los Angeles has got a lot of crime. High crime is next. High homelessness. I was in Los Angeles, folks, just about 10 months ago doing media, and I'm in a Tony area of Los Angeles going to do a big-time podcast, and there were homeless tents and tarps all over the sidewalk. I began to look around. Where are the police to come shut it down? Nope. It's just, and I mean Mercedes and Beamers and Bentleys <laughs> zipping right by. Nobody's doing a thing about it. Well, you would imagine with high taxes, high crime, and high homelessness, you'd have high levels of exits. And you do. Where are these people going? <laughs> They're going to Dallas, Fort Worth, and other cities like Nashville and cities in Florida. Why? Well, let's look at the boom city. Well, Dallas-Fort Worth, less government. Interestingly enough, lower taxes, lower crime, lower homelessness, and as a result, more entries. So why am I sharing this with you? Because if you live in an area where it is about more government regulation that puts a onus on small businesses, where you see more government control and less freedom for the citizens, you're going to see higher crime. You're going to see higher homelessness, higher taxes. Listen, there's your sign. This could affect my business. This could affect my home value. I got to get out. I got to go where it's booming. And what are the signs of a boom? Freedom. Less government more freedom. There it is, folks. Are you wondering if you should leave your current job or stay put? You're not alone. That's why we created the Should I Quit My Job quiz. In just five minutes or less, this quiz will help you determine if you're at the right company and if you're in the right role. If you need to make a move, you'll even get practical next steps to keep you moving forward. Listen, stuck is a choice, and life is too short not to do what you were created to do. To take the quiz, go to kencoleman.com slash quiz.
You were created to fill a unique role in your work. That means you are needed, and it means you must do it. Somebody out there needs you to show up and be the best version of you. I want you to stop thinking about work as this occupation that I just have to do to live, and I want you to begin to think about work as a unique contribution that you were created to make. And if you can do that, I'm going to tell you something, your money through Friday will change forever, and we'll watch your income and watch your overall health increase as well. I created a tool to help you figure out what is that work that I was created to do. It's called the Get Clear Career Assessment. It is a tool. It is an awareness tool that takes you about 12 to 15 minutes max, and you're going to get a very detailed report on what you do best. That's your talent, what you love to do. That's passion and what results motivate you. That's your sense of mission, and when I can see a report on all three of those things, I begin to see myself in my unique contribution. It's a powerful tool. Tens and tens and tens of thousands of people have taken it, and it has changed their perspective and their future. You can get it at kencoleman.com slash assessment, kencoleman.com slash assessment. Let's go to Jason now, who's on the line in Baltimore, Maryland. Jason, how can we help? Hey, Ken, how are you doing? I am living the dream. What's going on? (laughs) I I have... um a question for you. So I'm right now I work in the automotive industry. Um, I'm been a mechanic. Uh, Currently I'm a service advisor. Um, I'm trying to get into the, uh, insurance field, uh, as an auto damage adjuster, insurance adjuster. And I read the book, the proximity principle, and I'm trying to use what I've learned, uh, in doing that and helping me in, in order to get this, this job, it, it's something that I've been wanting to do for a couple of years now. And I'm trying to get myself, uh, as close as I can to, um, gain an employment in that, in that field. Um, being, uh, with talking to, I, I have another friend who's gone to that same career path that I've, that I want to go, uh, talk to him, got to bounce some ideas off of him. Um, as part of what I do on a daily basis, um, I do talk to insurance adjusters frequently, Every chance I get, I'll, I'll kind of grab their ear and ask them, hey, you know, do you have any advice? Do you have any, you know, uh, can you tell me about day-to-day stuff? Do you have any tips for me to get into the industry? Um, I've tried to, to, to do that. I've also um, so what's happened? been applying. Tell me, what well, tried, tell me what tried looks like. What, what have so you done and what's not working? I've been, I've put in applications that it, basically all the different insurance um, companies. Um, I've gotten to different stages of the process with different companies. Um, so what I ended up doing is I figured, okay, well, maybe I need to show that I'm uh, serious about this, that I actually can do it. Um, I went, went out on my own. I found a um, internet course where I can take, and even though my state doesn't require a license, I've gone out and um, taken the classes got certified, yeah. got my adjuster's license uh, out of the state of Florida. But have uh, you had any use, interviews? I've So I have had interviews. Um, how many? One of the companies, probably like four or five. Okay, how far did you get? Was it just one and done, or did you have multiple? Well, what? with one of the companies, I went all the way up to a, a basically a, a pretend mock day of work where I did a, a, like a two hours where I was put in different scenarios. Um, lately, um, I've just, it's, it's, it's a little bit harder because most of the, especially the bigger companies, everything's done online. So whenever I get an interview, I'm not actually interviewing with a real person. They have a pre recorded question yeah. and then I video yeah. record myself answering the question, but I yeah. never get any feedback. You know, what feedback did you get from the, uh, from the fake day at work? That sounds like you went pretty far in the process and they had you kind of come in and walked you through some, some type of simulation. Did you get any feedback on that? Not really. It was okay. Thanks for your time. And then uh, I just got a, a email letter, you know, a week or two later saying, okay. Oh, you know, yeah. thank you for coming in. We've yeah. pursued different candidates. Well, here's the deal. I mean, there is no silver bullet. And, and I can only tell you that the, you cannot keep doing what you're doing or else you'll become discouraged and you may already be there. And I I understand that you've read proximity principle and you've tried to do it, but there's a difference between trying to do it and doing it. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's a difference between trying to swim and swimming. 
trying to swim involves a lot of splashing and movement, and then I start, I stop. Swimming is just I get in the pool, I push off, and I'm swimming. Mm-hmm. And and so I, the reason I'm giving you that example is because you've done a little bit of the proximity principle by talking to some people that are in the business, but when you're looking at actual jobs that are available, okay, so company XYZ, company ABC, uh, company, you know, DEF, and when we see those jobs listed, okay, we now need to employ the proximity principle there and go, okay, do I know anybody that works at these companies? And if the answer mm-hmm. is no, do I know anybody who knows somebody that works over there? Okay. Mm-hmm. And then it starts in to the degrees of connections there. Do I know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody? Because what has to happen is you have to go from this nameless, faceless person talking to an AI robot, and you've got to have somebody going, I've heard great things about Jason. Here's who I heard them from, and there's credibility there. And so Jason has applied. He went through all those stuff, but here's Jason's resume, and and on this resume are two or three really strong endorsements from people that that I know. Mm-hmm. And maybe endorsements from people in the insurance adjustment business. But you have to be maniacal in your focus to go, I cannot do the online only game anymore. I might as well go buy a lottery ticket while I'm at it. Mm-hmm. Because it's the same situation. But when you really lock in, Jason, and I, and I love and I'm applauding you for having the few conversations that you've had with people that are in the industry. you got to keep doing it, though. If yeah. I want to get into insurance adjustments, I have got to keep connecting with people in that industry, even meet some people who are in a position to hire for that role that don't yeah. have an opening right now. Mm-hmm. Now, I want to remind you, I don't know if you know my story or not, but I'm, I'm 33 when I started into broadcasting. I kept connecting and kept connecting and kept connecting. And many times I was connecting when there wasn't even a job available. But I was just connecting. Hey, I want to get in. I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to do this. And finally, I finally got a breakthrough moment when I remember doing a favor for somebody who uh, had, a, had a friend. And I did a favor for my friend for her friend. And her friend mentioned in our lunch that she... And her family owned a radio station in Gainesville, Georgia. And I called her back and I said, hey, do you remember our lunch? She goes, yeah, you really helped me out. Thank you very much. Hey, I'm wondering if you could help me out. Can you get me an interview with your family that runs that station? She said, are you kidding me? When can you do it? Give me three or four options. This week it'll be done. And that led to me finally getting on the radio after about a three to four year process of doing what you're doing. I'd have a conversation here, I'd have a conversation there. But I didn't get maniacal until about six months prior to the story I just told you. But when I got really serious about making connections, saying, hey, do you know somebody over there? Do you know somebody over there? Do you know somebody over there? And that's when we stand out and we break through the stack of now digital resumes. Do you understand what I'm saying? There is no Mm -hmm. silver bullet. I don't have some little hack for you. You have to stay with it. And if you've got to go work in some other field, while or just get a J O B, if you get, do what it takes to stay alive, to keep your nose up until finally that opportunity comes in and somebody opens a door for you and you just walk right through it and you beat everybody else. But you beating everybody else is not interviewing better. You beating everybody else is somebody giving you the job before it's listed because you've talked to everybody and everybody and you've got a list of everybody who's doing insurance adjusting in the greater Baltimore area. And you make it your full-time hobby early in the morning, late at night, Saturday mornings, Sunday afternoons, I am going to find a connection over here and eventually I'm going to get the gig. Folks, this isn't just for Jason, this is for a lot of you. This is just grit. you got to decide. You can't be stopped. This is the Ken Coleman Show. Did you know that recruiters take an average of six seconds to scan a resume? And that's if they ever see it in the first place. 
In fact, 75% of resumes are rejected before reaching a hiring manager. Listen, folks, if you want to get hired, you've got to make your resume worth noticing. That's why we created How to Write the Perfect Resume. This free guide will walk you through the five steps to stand out in the hiring process to get you your dream job. If you want to get started, go to kencoleman.com slash resume. Welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show. All right. Times are wacky in the world of work. The newest headline, this is a New York Post article, Zoom tells employees they must return to office for work. I've had, uh, Alex told me he's had several people sending this. I just checked my DMs probably 10 minutes after you left my desk this morning, and a bunch of people were forwarding it to me on Instagram. Like, oh, Ken wants to talk about this, I'm sure. I mean, this is interesting because this is Zoom. This is Zoom. If you if you just remember back to the pandemic, take yourself back to, uh, let's call it March, April of 2020 when everybody was like, what is happening? Nobody knew. Everybody was working from home, most people. And all of a sudden, this company that many of you had never heard of before, I hadn't, all of a sudden, this way of talking to people on your computer, which, by the way, I was already doing via FaceTime. I'm a big Apple guy. So I was, you know, but all of a sudden, I kept hearing about Zoom. Zoom, 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 Zoom. It was everywhere. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Hey, let's do a zoom. It became a, a, it became an action verb. Hey, uh, can you zoom later today? I'm not kidding. Hey, uh, can you zoom right now? Hey, let's do a zoom. It was like a verb. Then it was a noun. Hey, yeah, let's set up a zoom. That's a noun. Then it was, Hey, can you zoom later this week? It became a part of the culture. Blew up. Stock price went bananas. And then we all got used to zooming. And it wasn't such a big deal anymore because we realized we had other options. Towards the end of toward the end of 2021, Zoom stock plummeted. And the company has since lost at least $100 billion. I have to pause on that. They lost $100 billion in market share after it went bananas in 2020. In January of 2022, Zoom said only 2% of its employees worked on site. Now, Zoom has two offices in the United States, San Jose, California, and Denver, Colorado. They employ more than 8,400 people worldwide. Now, this is making headlines because Zoom was entirely based on a product that allowed you to work from anywhere because you could have a meeting from anywhere. And Zoom was the prototypical remote company with a remote product. And now they want people coming back in. Now, these headlines are never fully transparent. The headline says, Zoom tells employees to return to office for work. But it's actually asking all their employees within 50 miles of a company office to go in at least two days a week. So this is, again, a hybrid model. Two days. They're saying at least, bare minimum, you need to be in the office two days a week. Now, this is from a spokesperson at Zoom when asked about the new position. They said, as a company, we are in a better position to use our own technologies and continue to innovate and support our global customers when we are together. So from for this big work from home movement, the people that go, you know what, look, we can innovate. There is no limitations on innovation or collaboration if we work from home. This is Zoom, and Zoom is saying, 
we want you in the office at least two days a week because we think that collaboration and innovation will improve. So again, the world of work, it's going to constantly be evolving. This is very interesting because we've seen the amount of remote jobs shrink back to pre-2020. And so I bring this up because there's still a lot of people. The numbers are about 76% I saw in some data in researching this topic today. People saying, if I have to go back in, I'm out. Well, where are you going to go? You may start coming up with a side hustle because the remote jobs, 100% remote, have shrunk and they may keep shrinking for a while. We shall see. According to Glassdoor, the average job offer attracts over 250 applicants. If you've made it to the interview, you've already made a great impression. So now is the time to showcase how you are the best choice for the role. That's why we created How to Win the Interview. This free guide will walk you through the five strategies to help you stand out amongst the competition. With just some intentionality, you can prepare yourself to win the interview. Go to kencoleman.com slash interview. Right, time for your generational update. Here I am, Gen Xer, who some of these Xers, uh, uh, some of these Gen Z people that follow me on social, or some of them, you know, they're, they're not even following me, but my posts will get out there, you know, out in the wild, and they love to call me Boomer. It cracks me up, you know, because I'm the, you know, sensical older fella. Now they think I'm nonsensical. Any of you with sense know that I am actually sensical. That's the irony in all of it. So this is important stuff because this is the generation. They're the youngest generation in the workforce. Uh, they are coming in in droves. So the latest uh, TikTok or post or tweet. No, this was a tweet, actually. By the way, Alex, can you call them tweets anymore if the company is now named X? Does anybody know what that is now? If the company's name is X, what are my little posts? Marks. Marks. Okay, I like that, Alex. That's pretty creative. Uh, okay, this is a, a tweet that went viral, and this is from Samira Khan, an India-based director of people success at a company called Infido. It's an employee experience platform. And so she wrote about this on Twitter, and it went viral. And this is her tweet. I was interviewing a Gen Z intern today, and he says he is looking for work-life balance with not more than five hours of work, doesn't like the MNC culture, so wants to work at a startup, also wants forty dollars to $50,000 stipend. God bless the future of work. How about that? So this guy wants a five-hour workday and a $600 stipend, which again plays out to the forty to $50,000. Can you imagine? $600 stipend a week, I believe, is what that, that boils down to. And he wants to work five hours a day. Now, let me just say this before I go any further. This kid is either delusional or out of his mind brave, like courageous to the point of, you know, you know, it's like going all in if you're playing poker and you don't even know what your hand is. That's borderline delusional, but it also could be very brave. So that, let's keep going. The post, which is now approaching a million views, sparked comments. And this is what I want to dive into, okay? Samira goes back on and comments, I hire Gen Z every quarter. No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I got ahead of myself. 
this is what she commented on the post, and then I'm going to get into the, to the other people's comments, a couple of them. She said, here's my take, commenting on her own tweet. Prioritizing work-life balance early on is great, but while looking for the first few internships, one should look for learning, growth, good projects, and peers. Balance gets struck eventually. To which point I say, balance is a myth. I, I I hope some people get what I'm saying. This idea of, I want good work-life balance. Now, let me just tell you right now, there's no such thing. Okay, I am a husband of 25 years. I've got three teenagers, 17, 15, and 14 I have a national broadcast. I don't have work-life balance. I spend a minimum of eight hours a day at the office. I get about eight hours of sleep. I hardly see my family in the morning because I'm up early. They're all doing their thing, especially summertime. The kids are like vampires. They're up all hours of the night. And they sleep in late. You know, I get it. There's no balance there. It's off balance. I spend more time at work than I do anything else. Balance is overrated. Balance is almost impossible for a serious man or woman. So let's just get that out of the way. Okay? I need to be out of balance. If I'm, if I'm winning in life... I'm not balanced. I don't balance my amount of Netflix watching with my work. I better be exercising more than I'm eating. Balance. I'm so sick of all these weak people talking about how much balance they need. That's why you're weak. It's like saying, I want to be well-rounded. What? You want to be a ball? You want to be shaped like a ball? You want to be a ball? You want to be a sharp instrument? All right, back to this. Here are some of the comments on this. Kid is an intern. He's applying for an internship and says, I only want to intern for five hours a day. And I need a $600 a week stipend for me to learn how to freaking be effective. So this is what, there's a couple comments I want to pull out to this viral post. One person says, I hire Gen Z every quarter, and they can't take pressure at all. But they expect a huge amount of money. They're creative, but they're taking jobs for granted. That's one post. And then a, another person disagreed saying, thank God at least Gen Z is setting up expectations and not agreeing to be a corporate slave with no life and all work. Good for them. All right, now, I pull out these two comments because they're at extremes. The one guy shouldn't say that all Gen Z are creative and they can't take pressure, though. It's not true. There are some Gen Z who absolutely eat pressure for breakfast. So we've got to stop with the generalizations. They, they Listen, people said this about millennials. People said this about my generation. I, I, it just is what it is. Have you ever seen Back to the Future where they kind of take us back to the 50s? There was a word called slacker. All right? So every generation kind of gives the, the generation behind them a hard time because there are snowflakes in every generation. All right? But this one comment, not agreeing to be a corporate slave, first of all, we ought not throw that word around lightly. There's a huge difference between what we know in modern day and ancient slavery and you actually showing up and doing your job. We ought not throw that word around. In a day and age where everybody gets offended by everything, you should actually be offended when someone compares working a normal work week or work month or work year and compare it to slavery. That's actually ludicrous and offensive five hour day an eight hour day being compared to the evils of human trafficking and slavery 
please stop it already. Now, let me tell you something. This all comes down to one thing. Young people, I don't care what generation, Gen Z, millennials, my generation, it doesn't matter. You look through the history of work. When someone is demanding something like this, it is a function of how they were raised, the experience and environment that has colored their mind to be able to be delusional enough to say, yeah, I only want to work five hours. Okay, great. Then go get yourself a part-time job because that's a part-time job. And I don't, I don't begrudge anybody. If you want to work part-time, fantastic. But don't ask for full-time pay and part-time hours. And folks, I'm telling you, we have more and more of this generation, the Gen Zers that are really into this anti-work movement, where it's the least amount of work possible, but pay me really well. Oh, and I want flexibility as well. <laughs> you earn flexibility. You earn freedom at work. By being excellent, working hard, and then determining, I want to live my life this way. But tell you where this is going. This is setting our nation up to be more and more susceptible to socialism and its work policies. That's where it starts, by the way. And then it gets into politics and erodes all freedom. Work is good. Work is honorable. We need more young people willing to do it. This is The Ken Coleman Show. Thanks for listening to The Ken Coleman Show. For more, you can find the show on demand wherever you listen to podcasts and watch the show on YouTube. You can also find Ken across all social media by following at Ken Coleman.